We know that when we talk about making time for each other, making time for our relationship, we know the first thing that most people are going to say. Oh, I don't have time for all that. I have to work 40 plus hours a week. I have to go home and cook. I have to take care of the kids. And we're acknowledging that all of those things are still happening. But you make time for yourself. Everybody takes care of themselves. And you probably think, well, duh, I have to do that. Yeah, you do. You have to take care of yourself, but you also have to take care of your marriage. And we take care of ourselves, right? Because if we don't, we could get sick and die. It's exactly the same way for your marriage. If we don't take care of our marriage by making time for each other, our relationship will suffer and could eventually die. Well, if you don't know who we are, my name is Marcus Hooper. I'm the digital media pastor here at Pathway Church. And I'm his wife, Amy Hooper. I often serve on here on the worship team or upstairs in Pathway Kids. Yes. Yeah, so if you're a parent, you've probably seen her before. Uh, you've probably seen her on the stage before. She is definitely my better half. Uh, so she's the better part of this duo for sure, for sure. Well, if you'll please stand with us for the initial reading of God's word, as is our tradition here at Pathway Church. We're continuing the series we still do in our marriage month here at Pathway, and our sermon today is called Make Time. Make Time. So we're going to be talking all about making time for each other and making time to prioritize our relationship. We're going to be reading from Ephesians 5, 22 through 29. For wives, this means to submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is also the savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. For husbands, this means love your wives, just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much that we get to be here this morning. Thank you for your word, and I pray that we will take the truth from your word and uh, that we will grow to be better people, better believers, better friends, and better husbands and wives every single day. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. You can be seated. So we know that when we talk about making time for each other, making time for our relationship, we know the first thing that most people are going to say. Oh, I don't have time for all that. I have to work 40 plus hours a week. I have to go home and cook. I have to take care of the kids and they have sports practice or dance practice and all this stuff. I have to go to church. I have to serve on Wednesdays. I do not have time. And we're acknowledging that all of those things are still happening. But that leads us to our first point, which is you make time for yourself. You make time for yourself. In that passage we just read, it said, in the same way, Husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. Now, this is referencing husbands, but we believe this principle applies to husbands and wives. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church. Yeah, as that passage said, everybody takes care of themselves, and you probably think, well, duh, I have to do that. Yeah, you do. You have to take care of yourself, but you also have to take care of your marriage. Genesis 2.24 says that the two shall become one flesh. So a marriage isn't just two people living in the same household, kind of going along, taking care of themselves. It's two halves of one whole unit taking care of each other. Right. And we take care of ourselves, right? Because if we don't, we could get sick and die, right? If we don't take care of ourselves, if we don't do personal hygiene and make sure that we're healthy and we're okay, we could get sick and die, right? Well, 
it's exactly the same way for your marriage. If we don't take care of our marriage by making time for each other, our relationship will suffer and could eventually die. So just as you make time to take care of your own body, heart, and mind, in the same way, you have to make time to take care of and connect with your spouse. Now we're gonna show you something that we call the Christian priority list. Now we're only gonna show you the top three. And this isn't something that we just came up with or it's just our opinion. This is based on scripture and what scripture teaches. So we're gonna show you this list right here. So as you can see, and this list to explain it a little bit, this is what Christians should prioritize and in what order they should prioritize them. So as you can see, number one on the list is God. And let me tell you, he should be at the, at the top of the list. And some of you may say, well, yeah, obviously. But I mean, there's even, it's even one of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt have no other God before me. But let me tell you, and, and I'm not speaking from a high horse here. I've been guilty of this many times. If anything else is at the top of your list, if anything else is being prioritized above God in your list, even if that's family, even if it's your spouse, even if it's your job, even if it's ministry or the church, if anything other than God is at the top of your list, that's what your God is. Even if you don't realize it, whatever you worship, whatever your God is, is the thing that you devote number one priority to in your life. So if it's not God, then whatever's at the top of your list is your God, even if you don't know it. So God should always, always, always be at the top of the list. Now, number two, you'll notice, is a tie between yourself and your marriage, um, specifically your physical and mental health and your relationship's health. And we saw that in the passage we just read, right? It said, just as you take care of yourself, you should take care of your spouse. And that's why we have them tied for the same position, because we believe that the Bible is saying that you really should prioritize both things as equal, yourself, your personal health, and your marriage. Yes, exactly. Um, and we're not saying that your wants are necessarily equal to your marriage. If I want something that's not going to benefit us, it's not equal. Um, so anything, you and your partner are one flesh. So anything that I can do to make Marcus more healthy and feel better is beneficial to the marriage. I should do it and he should do for me when I'm not healthy. And in the same way, we both have to work at keeping the marriage healthy. Now, some people may disagree with this ranking. You may think that there are some things that aren't here in the top three that should be in the top three. There might be some people who are saying, well, jo your job should be higher on the list because if you don't prioritize your job, then you can't take care of your spouse or your kids. And yes, obviously, we need to pay bills and things like that. But here's something, and, and I'm guilty of this too. How many times have I been working too much and I wasn't prioritizing Amy, I wasn't prioritizing myself or my spiritual walk with God. But if you're saying, oh, I, but I have to work, because I, I have to provide for my family, so I have to prioritize work. But if you're working so hard to provide for your family that you're never around and your family falls apart, then what was the point? If you're working so much to provide for a family that falls away and crumbles, then it was all for nothing. So because of that, your family and your marriage and your kids, they have to come above that. Yes, we need to pay the bills and take care of our family, but God has entrusted us with a partner, and for some of us, he's entrusted us with children. And if we can't steward what God has already given us, then why would he give us more? Why would God trust us with great riches if we can't even take care of the family that he's already provided for us? The third thing on our list is kids. A lot of people, you know, say, oh, the kids have to come first, kids come first. And we would agree in situations of abuse. We definitely yes. don't want you keeping your kids in an abusive situation. But in a healthy family dynamic, your spouse does need to come first. You two are, like we said, a whole unit working together to raise those kids. So if they don't have a healthy foundation, they're not going to turn out so great. <laughs> right. And think about airplanes, right? They always say... Don't put the mask on the kids first. You have to put the mask on yourself first. Because if you pass out, now who's gonna help the kids? The principle's the same in marriage. If your marriage is falling apart, how are you gonna properly help your kids if, you, if, if what's going on right here is not working and it's falling apart? Yeah, exactly. We've seen many marriages where the kids were put first and the, the marriage was on the back burner. And like, we've seen it in both our own parents. And through the grace of God, those marriages have been healed and the children have been healed. We've been healed. Yes. But it, you just see the way that they suffer. It can be traumatic and lead to issues later on. Yeah, and, and like Amy said, obviously we don't have kids right now. 
but we've experienced this from the kids' perspective. We've seen what can happen when, when the marriage is put on the back burner. Even though my, our parents were in this situation, they were prioritizing us over their marriage, but it ended up kind of traumatizing us and, and really being worse off for us than it would have been the other way around. And when marriages aren't put at the, before the kids, before work, before everything else, when marriages are put on the back burner, that change doesn't happen overnight. That falling apart doesn't happen overnight. It's a slow fade. And that brings us to our second point, which is changing together. Now, whether we know it or not, each and every one of us is changing every single day. You're not the same person you were 10 years ago. You're not the same person you were five years ago. Marcus is not the same man that I met five years ago, but I'm also not the same woman that he met five years ago. She's more beautiful now than she was five years ago. <laughs> so much has happened to us, both individually and together, that would have been impossible to stay the same. So the key was growing together, changing together, staying on the same page. We check in with each other. We're honest about our mental, physical, and spiritual health. We go on weekly date nights, mm -hmm. and we talk about things like work, friends, family, anything that's on our minds. So even though he's not the same person that I met, I still know him because we've put in the effort to know each other. Right, and if we're not careful, and we're not keeping that connection, we can turn into two people that don't, don't like each other, two people that, that maybe hate each other, that are incompatible. For example, my parents, Rich and Tanya, some of you may have heard their testimony already, but if you haven't, basically, they've been in ministry their whole life, and when we were kids, they were prioritizing ministry, and us, and the church, and their job, which was ministry, over themselves, over their marriage. And, you know, a lot of Christians, a lot of people can think, good for them, like prioritizing ministry. That's great. But what happened was, slowly over time, my parents started to change into two different people. And because they weren't keeping this connection, they didn't realize who they were changing into. Until one day, they realized they didn't like each other. In fact, I would go so far as to say they hated each other. These two people that, had, that they had changed into, they might not have even dated in the first place. If this is who they were way back at the beginning when they met, they might not have even gotten together in the first place. They were now incompatible. They were miles apart. And the world would say, well, if you're incompatible, then it's over. I'm sorry. You're, you're incompatible. It's, it's done. Your relationship is over. But we know that God... God can do all things, right? We just sang that this morning. He can do all things. There's nothing impossible for him. And you know what? My parents' marriage, it almost ended. They were talking about divorce. They were talking about serving each other with papers. It was that close to being over. But God spoke to them. He spoke to my dad specifically. And he told him, because my dad was the one who was instigating talks of divorce, he was the one that was like, I don't want to do this anymore. We're done. But God spoke to him and he said, you don't want anybody else. You don't want anybody else. You want the mother of your children. That's who you want to be with for the rest of your life. And it broke my dad. And the next day, he brought lunch to my mom at work. She thought he was coming with divorce papers. That's how close it was. She thought he was coming with divorce papers that day. But instead, he said, I don't want anybody else. I am committed to making this work. And you know what? It was hard. It didn't happen overnight. Just like they didn't change into two different people overnight, it didn't get healed overnight either. But you know what? They committed. They committed to grow back together. They said, we'll do whatever we need to do. They both went to counseling. They both compromised on things. They both admitted that, you know what? I've done some things too. It's not just you who's the problem. We're both the problem, and we need to, to work on that. So if we don't periodically check in and have a meaningful connection, we'll both change in opposite directions. Think of, think of a vine. If there's two vines growing, and you're growing these vines, and you want to grow fruit on these vines, if you don't guide them, they could grow off like this into opposite directions. And then when the fruit starts to grow, it can be too heavy and destroy the plant altogether. But if you guide those vines to grow together, and they intertwine, they'll be even stronger. And then when the fruit grows, they'll be able to handle it. Yeah, so how do we do that? How do we take this and change together? 
Our favorite way, like we mentioned, is a weekly date night. And these are, don't always have to be like a fancy, extravagant, expensive dinner every week because it's not realistic. We don't do that. We cannot afford big, fancy dinners. And to be transparent, we, we missed our date night this week because Amy's sister was coming into town. So we don't always do it either. We missed it this past Friday. But it's just about making that effort and trying to do it as much as you can. Yeah, yeah, and just any time that you two can get away by yourselves and reconnect in a meaningful way with meaningful conversation, that can be your date night. Uh, but we also need to keep each other accountable in our spiritual lives. Mm. So each of us need to have a close relationship with God. Both of us need to be working on it, but we also need to come together in our spiritual walk and build that foundation together. Um, so sitting together in church when you can, serving together, praying together, reading the word together, great ways to build that foundation. Even just this week, there was something I was really worried about and was really weighing on me. And we were just in the car on the way to Walmart, and Marcus prayed for me. And just every moment like that, even the little moments, build us stronger. And a lot of you parents might be out there right now saying, oh, but we can't get a sitter. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> Amy loves babysitting kids, especially if you have an infant. She loves babies. I call her the baby whisperer because so many times she's gotten a baby to go to sleep and the baby's own mother is like, how did you do that? I cannot get them to go down. And she's like, I don't know. I just, I just did it. You know, so I'm, I'm excited when we have our own kids. She's going to be a great mom. Um, but, but seriously, we know that it's, it's not realistic to go out every week if you're a parent. You can't get a sitter every week. It's just not realistic. And Amy and I are, are lucky enough to be in a phase of our marriage where we don't have kids yet. So our schedule is a lot more wide open, right? But like Amy said, you don't have to go out every week. It's not about going to a fancy restaurant every week or even going to a restaurant at all every week. What if, this is just, this is just an idea, just an example. What if one, one week you just wait until the kids go to bed, and then you just stay up for an extra hour, and you just do something, just something special. If it's, if it's playing board games, just whip out sorry. If it's watching a movie, turn on Netflix. If it's just talking to each other for one uninterrupted hour, then just talk. It doesn't have to be fancy or elaborate or even romantic. It just has to be real. You just have to make a heart-to-heart -heart connection where you're not on your phone, you're not distracted, you're not thinking about anything else. You're thinking about each other, you're making that connection, and you're checking in with each other. Just as, just as it's important to go to church every week, right? It's, the Bible says, do not forsake the assembly. One of the reasons it's important for us to go to church weekly is because we need to recharge our spirit, right? And we need to reestablish those healthy connections with fellow Christians. Well, just in the same way, it's important to connect with your spouse weekly so that you can recharge the energy in your marriage and so that you can maintain that connection so that when you're changing, you're changing together and not changing apart. Yeah, and the, what we're describing here is not how the world loves. It's not how our non-Christian friends who are married. It's not how they operate. The world grows away from each other. They badmouth each other. They complain about each other on TikTok. Um, they hey, can I just say real quick? I'm sorry. Can I just say real quick? And I'm, again, not from a high horse because while I've never gossiped about Amy, I've participated in gossip about other people's spouses. Do not gossip about your spouse to your friends or to anybody. Now, obviously, if you need help, if you need assistance, if you need counsel, absolutely reach out to somebody you trust. You know, you don't have to do it alone. But please don't gossip about your spouse. Because when you're married, you have a bond of trust there. And if you're talking about your spouse behind their back and complaining about them and going, oh, they're so bad, they're so terrible, they're doing so and so again, then you're breaking that bond of trust. And this goes for men and women. I've seen it from both. It's not, it's not a gender thing at all. Both need to be careful that they're not gossiping about their spouse to other people. And we have been very careful about that too. If I've ever reached out to someone about anything that's been going on, I've made sure that it's not in a, I'm gossiping about Amy way, that it's in a, I just need help and I need guidance about something that we're going through right now. So, sorry, that was a, little, a bit of a soapbox, but uh, I, no one in here, I've never seen anyone in here do that, but it's a trend right now on social media, especially on TikTok, of people going like, oh, look at my husband, look at my wife, they never do blah, 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 and it just drives me crazy. So anyway, that's that. So couples who make habits of that and don't get to know each other, they end up 
eventually getting divorced. So if we're going to not be like the world and we're going to be like Christ, the way that we do that is that we love as Christ loved. A lot of women have trouble with this passage that we read at the beginning. Because of the wording of the metaphor, it seems that women have to just give up everything. Oh, women have to submit to their husbands. The end. But it's not where it stops. If we look at the metaphor and kind of pull it apart a little bit, the Bible often uses the relationship of a bride and a groom to relate to a husband, or sorry, a bride and a groom to relate to Christ and the church and the way he loves us. Um, so in this, in this passage, it says to submit to your husband, so it's asking her to give up everything for her husband. But it doesn't stop there. It doesn't just end with that. It, it says that husbands should love their wives as their husband, or as Christ loved the church. And he doesn't say how he loves the church. Paul said how he loved the church. And how Christ loved the church was giving up his life for the church. He laid down everything. So the scripture does say, yes, wives give up, be willing to give up everything for your husband and husbands be willing to give up everything for your wives. Right. It's, it's an equal calling for both spouses. And it's interesting because we kind of found this revelation while we were studying for this message because of the metaphor that it used, because it's talking about Jesus in the church, it's not going to say husbands, you should submit like Jesus submits. Submit is not the right word when talking about Jesus and what Jesus did. When talking about what Jesus did for the church, you, he has to talk about the love of Christ. But that's why to us it can seem like it's asking way more of the wives than it is of the husbands. It's because of the word submit versus the word love. But like Amy just said, when you really look at it, it's asking the same thing of both partners. It's asking both partners to give up everything. Just as we're expected to give up everything for Christ, and just like Christ did give up everything for us, we're both expected to give up everything for each other. That's the kind of love both partners are supposed to have for their spouse. The love that would give up anything and everything. And then even beyond that, we're supposed to be each other's best friends, right? We're supposed to, she's supposed to be my best friend, and I'm very lucky that she is my best friend. And John 15, 13 says, there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Now, am I saying that you should go out and sacrifice yourself right now for your spouse? No, I'm not saying that. But the love that you should have for your spouse is the love that Christ has for us, which is the love that would be willing to give up everything for the other if they had to. That's why Marcus kills all the spiders in our house. Yes. He's willing to risk yes. his life so I can stand over there and say, it's right there. Right. We live in the middle of a field, so we get spiders in our house all the time. Maybe they feel the Holy Spirit and they just want to worship with us, but, but many a time she's been like, babe, there's a spider, and I have to go down there and wrestle with it, you know? So I'm, I'm giving up my life for her so that she can be saved. <laughs> But that's the love that wives should have for their husbands and husbands should have for their wives. But what if your spouse isn't a believer? What if you're a Christian? What if you've given your heart to Christ, but your spouse hasn't? Or what if they had in the past, but now they've strayed and now they're not really following Christ anymore? What are you supposed to do then? Well, the Bible actually tells us yeah, in 1 Corinthians 7, 14 through 17, it says, For the believing wife brings holiness to her marriage, and the believing husband brings holiness to his marriage. Otherwise, your children would not be holy, and now they are holy. But if the husband or wife who isn't a believer insists on leaving, let them go. In such cases, the believing husband or wife is no longer bound to the other, for God has called you to live in peace. Don't you wives realize that your husbands might be saved because of you? And don't you husbands realize that your wives might be saved because of you? Each of you should continue to live in whatever situation the Lord has placed you and remain as you were when God first called you. This is my rule for all the churches. So the passage is saying that you should continue to love your spouse and pray for them to come to Christ. It says, don't you realize that your spouse might be saved because of you? So how do you know that they can't come to Christ or that they won't ever come to Christ just from your love and your prayer and the Holy Spirit working? Pastor Mike, who's not here today, he's watching online, um, he has shared many times that he was living far from Christ, was not chasing after Jesus when he was younger, but Pastor Lori continued to pray for him 
every single day, continued to love on him until he came back to Jesus. And now they are on fire for the Lord and they're passionately in love with each other. And it's so sweet. And I know many of you in this room have the exact same story where one of you was loving Jesus, chasing Jesus, and you just had to keep praying for your partner every single day, keep inviting them to church. And eventually they did. And now you have a beautiful testimony. Now, of course, if your spouse, like we said earlier, is abusing you or your children, you should leave. You, you shouldn't stay because it says God wants us to live in peace, not in turmoil. And it says if, you're, if your unbelieving spouse tries to go, you've tried to reconcile, you've tried counseling, and they just, they're just, no, I'm done, to let them go. And I know that's really hard. But again, it says to live in peace, not in turmoil, to let them go. And just like Amy said, there are, there are people in this room right now who, whose testimony is exactly that where one of the one spouse wasn't believing or they had strayed and the other one just continued to pray and to love them. And it was because of that, directly because of that, that their spouse was like, you know what, maybe I'm gonna give this Jesus thing a try. Maybe I'm gonna give this church thing a try. And then Jesus turned their life around, turned their marriage around. It's happened so many times. We've done pathway stories about it. We've heard about it constantly. So just like it said, how do you know? How do you know that you won't turn their life around, that you won't be the one to convince them to come back to, ch to church? Or how do you know that your prayers won't be the thing that will bring them back? A few months ago, I, I spoke about love. And one of the things I talked about was the love of God. And because God is, is omniscient, right? Because God knows everything. He can look at someone and know for a fact that they are never going to trust him, that they are never going to accept him, that they will never become a believer. He knows for a fact that they are going to run away from him till the day they die. And yet he loves them and pursues them with the same tenacity that he pursues and loves us. It's the love that never ceases, that never quits despite any circumstance. And just like we said, obviously if there's abuse, or even in, in, when the Bible says if the unbelieving spouse wants out, you're allowed to let them go, you're allowed to separate. But the love that God is calling you to have, even if your spouse is an unbeliever, is the love that never ceases, that never quits through any circumstance. And that's what God is calling you to have as well. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Amy and I, we really feel on our hearts that, that we want to pray for the couples in this room or watching online. God, I just pray for, for every married couple in this room. Lord, even if they're dating, I just pray for every couple in this room, God. I pray that you will help them to prioritize their relationship, prioritize their health, because God, you have given them to each other. You've entrusted them with this marriage, with this relationship. So God, I pray that you will help them make time for each other, that you will help them to figure out the ways that they can grow and change together. And I pray that you will give them and all of us, even people who aren't in a relationship, the love of Christ, the love of God, the love that never ceases despite any circumstance. And Father, I pray for those, those couples who one partner is in love with you, chasing you, running after you, and their spouse is just not following you, whether they used to and they've turned away or they've never known you. God, I pray right now that for everyone who, that's their story in this room or watching online, God, that you would just anoint those couples. You would anoint that believing spouse. You would give them a new strength and a new peace and a new tenacity, God. Give them a new love for their spouse, that they would continue to chase after you and continue to intercede for their partner, to continue to pray for them, love them, invite them back to church until they're worn down. And God, I pray for that unbelieving spouse, whether they're here, whether they're watching, or whether they're somewhere else and aren't even hearing this message. Lord, I pray that you'd begin to move in their hearts right now, stir in their hearts, bring your Holy Spirit into their homes, and I ask that you would just draw this couple together and put a hunger in the unbelieving spouse's heart that they would run after you and chase after you with everything they have. And with every head still bowed and every eye still closed, there's one more prayer I want to pray. And if you're in this room or if you're watching online and you've said, you know what, I'm that other spouse. I'm the unbelieving spouse. I'm the spouse who's never believed or the spouse who's strayed. But I want to commit right now, today, 
I want to give this Jesus thing a try. I want my life to be turned around just like my spouse's life was turned around. And even if you at one point have accepted Christ already, but you are saying, you know what? I know that I've strayed away and I want to recommit. I want to recommit myself to Christ and I want to recommit myself to having a godly biblical marriage. And even if you're out here today and you're not married, but you're sitting here and you're thinking, you know what? I'm, I need Christ too. I want my life to be turned around. I'm not married, but I know that I need a change. Then we're going to pray this prayer and I want you to follow along with me and pray with me. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I love you, Lord. And I know and I accept and I believe that you died for my sins so that you could make me righteous, so that you could make me holy. And Lord, I know that there's nothing I can do. There's nothing I can do to wipe away these sins on my own. But I know that you've already done it for me. And I accept that gift of salvation. And I ask you to help me turn my life around. Show me what I need to do to change my life, to get closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now with every head still bowed, every eye still closed, there's one more thing we need to do. If you prayed that prayer today, if you accepted Christ into your heart for the first time, or even if you recommitted yourself, recommitted your heart to Christ today, the Bible says that you need to confess with your heart and confess publicly. Now, nobody's looking around. We're not going to bring you a mic. We're not going to have you get on stage. We're not going to have you come forward. All we're going to ask you to do is raise your hand. So if you said that prayer today for the first time, raise your hand and say, yes, I accepted Christ today for the first time, or I committed my life to Christ today because we want to celebrate with you. Heaven's looking on and we want to celebrate with you. If you're watching online and you accepted Christ for the first time or you recommitted your life, you can text the number on the screen or you can message us to let us know. We'd love to celebrate with you. Amen. Well, I am so glad that you guys are here. Let's give a hand clap for the Lord this morning because I really feel like he was moving in this house and online. God, I am so glad you showed up. So guys, I'm so glad you're here in person or watching online. We were glad to have you. If this is your first time or if you have any questions about what your next step may be, please meet us back in the next steps. We have an entire team there waiting just for you. It's back in the lobby. If you're watching online, you can text next to the number on your screen. I'm going to bless you guys before you go. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said... Amen. Y'all have an amazing week.